much and thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Alberto Nieto. I work with ESRI out of our Washington DC regional office. I closely work with our federal agencies and I also work with our spatial statistics and various Python development teams at ESRI. And I'm very happy to finally be able to engage with users again from from my home really and I hope everyone is doing okay in these times but uh, it's good to talk shop again and, and talk a little bit about Python. So today I want to get started with uh, a little bit of context. Um, let me take you back to some happier times back to our user conference when the theme of uh, the user conference was how GIS was the intelligent nervous system. Really this system that can be sensitive to what's happening in the world, that can inform decision makers on what to do, that can be really this nervous system to measure how the world is doing. And I don't think there's been a better opportunity to show that happening in real time than what we're seeing today, of course. Um, it's probably safe to say that most of us have come across this dashboard, the Johns Hopkins University dashboard that tracks total cases of COVID-19 across the world. And what I mean by this is really that the GIS that supports this, the, the front end, is, is really kind of backed up by not just the, the data and the dashboard, but by a, a comprehensive system. And those comprehensive systems don't just run on their own. An intelligent nervous system needs a lot of careful design, deployment, and nurturing. And in order to do that, we need really powerful tools and capabilities. And to that end, I think that's where Python really comes to bear. We need capabilities that can help us pipe data from the various sources of, it could be tracking cases, it could be tracking testing, it could be tracking any other phenomena, even not COVID related. Uh, but Python can become a, a scripting language that can be really useful, not just for hardcore developers, but really for anyone to use to, to start considering how to make that GIS truly a nervous system, especially during these times. And my point for today's hour is that it can help every member of the organization, whether you have experience in Python or not. Uh, you may just be getting started, and I hope that you can take some things home from, for, from this webinar. Or you may be quite experienced, and I hope that you can also take home some things from this webinar. Um, so today I wanna kinda iterate through a few use cases. First of all, if you're a GIS administrator, like many of us are, you may manage users, groups, and items. You can certainly use Python to automate a lot of that, and you can start to think, in, you can start to think about other ways to administer your organization and automate the monotonous activities that Many of us have to click a lot of times to do, right? Many of us also publish content or update content, whether that's feature services or dashboards, applications, et cetera. And Python can also be used to set up processes to automatically publish mass content or easily migrate content from one organization to another. And this not only helps automation, but also helps your your GIS be more reliable and frequently updated. Now, another part of Python that has become quite popular definitely in the past few years is the concept of Python for analysis. You may be a GIS analyst or a data scientist or really both, um, but you can, whenever you start working with analysis, it's very frequent that you'll see Python and the rich ecosystem of analysis libraries in Python be reference as good examples that you can follow. And finally, if you're a developer, let's say that your job is to empower the rest of your GIS team to use tools that you create. Jupyter Notebooks, which we'll cover briefly, have become a really powerful tool to quickly prototype ideas and document functionality. And that can help you quickly get tools out to your users. So, I'm gonna go through a few examples that, that highlight how those things are true, but I always like to clarify a few concepts. And for many of the experienced folks on the call, this may already be obvious, but I think it's good to repeat a little bit sometimes. Uh, and it, for the new folks, I think this is, this is a good overview of, of all the different components. We're gonna be talking about Python, obviously. We're also gonna cover Jupyter Notebooks, and then we're gonna cover a few libraries in ArcGIS, primarily 
ArcPy and the ArcGIS API for Python. And finally, we're going to touch on what we mean by ArcGIS notebooks. So Python, I don't have to spend too much time. I think most of us are familiar with Python. You decided to join this webinar with Python in the title. And I don't really have to sell it too much either. I think a lot of people already know about the value of Python, whether it's through your job or through your school or through colleagues that use it and examples that you've seen in the past. Now, one quick homework for the folks attending this call. When you get a chance after this webinar, open up a Python command prompt, type import this and execute it. I'll leave the mystery for you to solve. So it's widely adopted, not just here at Esri, it's widely adopted in the GIS community overall, and also the data science community. You've seen a lot of examples referencing machine learning concepts, data science concepts, statistics. Um, Python has really become a, a very powerful language there alongside R to expand what people can do from an analysis standpoint. And also the DevOps community, a lot of system administrators and people that are uh, in charge of maintaining operational systems. Python is very much a, a scripting language that can, can glue things together well there. So if you're looking for a language to learn these days, especially if you have some time at home, um, Python is really a safe choice. Obviously, there's others that I would also recommend. So now that takes us to Jupyter Notebooks. So what is a Jupyter Notebook? Well, a Jupyter Notebook is a scripting environment. It's very much where you can write Python. But one of the biggest differentiators there is that you can encapsulate what you write into these things called cells. So I've embedded a cell here in this slide, and I'm just going to write, hello, fellow social distancers. And we're going to just go ahead and execute it. And this is a simple print statement, one of the simplest lines that we can write, right? But with Jupyter Notebooks, it's not just about the code. Um, for instance, you can visualize the outputs of your code in a way that other people can interpret a little bit more easily. So I have another question for the folks on the line. You don't have to answer it, but just think to, to yourselves. I have two functions here that we've defined. One is called a chicken function, and it calls an egg function. The other function is called an egg function, and it calls the chicken function. Would you happen to know what happens if I execute one of these? I'll give you just three seconds to think about it. And now I'm going to illustrate exactly what happens. And that's a brief joke. So uh, my point there is that you can really bring multimedia to really highlight a lot of what's happening in your notebooks. And even though that was a joke, you can be a bit more serious and actually bring some content that can help you explain what you're doing in a notebook. And they have all the capabilities of an executable command interface. So if you execute Python somewhere, you can execute Python and Jupyter Notebooks in the same way. One more example that I have here, just to get started, I have a, a little function that I wrote called return best university, particularly in the United States. And if we execute it, it's basically going to process some data pertaining to the best universities in the country. So I found some trash records in the data, Florida State University and University of Georgia. We can throw those away. We don't need that. And determining final rankings, we found that the University of Florida happens to be the best university. I'm glad that everyone agrees, and we'll keep moving with this demonstration. So uh, continuing on, uh, those are just a few examples, but we can also use it to create and share documents. And I think Jupyter Notebooks, the reason they got so popular is really because they can be quickly shared. They, a lot of classes and universities use them. A lot of curriculums uh, almost entirely write their, their lesson plans and notebooks. And in fact, I'm using a Jupyter Notebook in this presentation. I'm not using PowerPoint or slides. I'm using uh, a Jupyter Notebook with an extension that lets me create slides out of each cell to actually present. And that's how I embedded a lot of the cells that you've seen so far. Another really important part of Jupyter Notebooks is that you can visualize data. So this cell right over here, this is actually a Jupyter Notebook interface. And I have a single cell here that creates some dummy data, essentially a series of dates, and creates six rows, 10 columns, and just some random numbers for each column. 
But what we can do is using something called pandas in the Python library, we can quickly create a table in Python memory and visualize it right under the cell. And that's really powerful if you're trying to work with analysis, if you're trying to visualize what your code is doing to some data and prototype some steps before you get to your final product. That's my favorite part of Jupyter Notebooks, frankly, the ability to see your data as you're working with it. And with um, the ArcGIS API for Python, you can also visualize data spatially. So it doesn't just have to be tabular data. You can actually create map widgets within your Jupyter Notebook, interact with the map widget, and continue from there. So those are a few points about Jupyter Notebooks. They're really a scripting environment that doubles as a presentation environment and as a documentation environment. It's become quite powerful due to all of those factors. So what we're gonna do here is actually just show you how you get started. And I do wanna show you one more example with Jupyter Notebooks. Um, you may be privy to a lot of the examples that different organizations are putting together for, for example, object detection. I just wanna show you some of the possibilities that are possible or some of the capabilities that are possible when you work with uh, Python. So right over here, you see me broadcasting. Actually, let me stop sharing and share a new window. So live to you here from my closet in my guest room. Uh, you see me and you see an object detection algorithm and a Python piece. And it's saying that I apparently need a haircut. It's not very nice. But this is just an idea to get your, your brain spinning on some of the capabilities that you can actually spin up when you're working with Python and the Python ecosystem. I'm gonna stop sharing there, go back to our notebooks. There we go. So how do you get access to all of this? How do you get started? Well, in ArcGIS Enterprise 10.7, we release something called ArcGIS Notebook Server. And ArcGIS Notebook Server becomes a, a component of the ArcGIS Enterprise deployment. And the way you would use it is you will see a new first line citizen here. You can select Notebook and it'll spin up a brand new Jupyter Notebook where you can execute Python code. This is the default template. You just basically start with a pretty basic uh, notebook, not too much there. Uh, and I'll give you some tips as you get started for the folks that are already experienced. You hopefully still get a few tips that maybe you haven't heard in the past, but here's a few things. First of all, there's uh, a help uh, button here at the top and a user interface tour. If you take that user interface tour, it takes you through a lot of what you can do from a notebook. Uh, you can also take a look at the keyboard shortcuts. The keyboard shortcuts are particularly helpful if you start working in Jupyter Notebooks quite a bit. Uh, my favorite sh keyboard shortcut by far is Shift Enter. Shift Enter lets you execute a cell. So this cell that you see here at the top simply imports the ArcGIS API for Python and makes an authentication to ArcGIS, ArcGIS being the current ArcGIS enterprise. So from there, I can import additional modules. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start typing import ArcPy. The fact that we can import ArcPy from ArcGIS Enterprise is actually quite powerful. We can bring all the geoprocessing tools that you typically use in ArcGIS Pro or ArcMap right up onto the server environment and pretty soon into ArcGIS Online as well. You can also bring in other libraries that are very powerful in Python. So Pandas is the one that you can use to manage data. Uh, or even things like TensorFlow, which you saw me use just a moment ago when we were doing that object detector. And it actually comes installed into the notebook server environment by default. So th this basically just loads some tools that we can start using from there. Now, the first thing that I wanna do, let's just create a simple map. So we already have this GIS object specified up there. Here's a little tip. If you wanna know what, what the, a GIS object, you can press period tab. And you get essentially a list of all the things that that GIS object can do, all the properties and all the methods. So one of the things that I wanna do, very simply, I wanna create a map. And this is a method, so we have to specify some parameters. Now, all of the parameters are optional, so I can actually just go ahead and execute GIS.map, no parameters. It'll create a map widget right here underneath. Just a base map for now, so we need to find some data to add to this. And let's go ahead and actually cast that to a variable. Let's say this is m equals GIS.map. We're gonna call and right there. And we can call M again later on and pass 
data to it or keep creating the map or, or referencing the map. Now to find data, you can use the ArcGIS API for Python, but I wanna highlight actually some of the GUI components of ArcGIS notebooks. So we can add data very similar to how you would add data to a web map. You can select the button that says add. And in this case, since we are living through this global pandemic, I'm gonna make the content as topical as possible. I'm gonna search for COVID-19 layers. And here's the one famous layer from Johns Hopkins University. And what I can do is there's code that references this layer that I can write from scratch, but if I don't happen to know that code, I can search for the layer that I want and select add to notebook. And it'll create this cell with reference to ArcGIS Online here, reference to the item ID, and then creating a variable called item. So let's go ahead and execute that. So there's our item. Now we can go call the item and pass it to a map or do really whatever we want with it. So let's go ahead and add it to our map. So we're gonna say m that at layer, and we're just gonna pass item, shift enter to execute that. And we're gonna zoom into the United States and see that data populated. So these are county level COVID-19 cases from Johns Hopkins. This is updated daily at this point. Now, this is just data, but we can go ahead and take a stab at some basic analysis. And I am going to reference a few COVID examples. I do wanna provide some caveats. I am not an epidemiologist. I am not an expert in this domain. So uh, please take everything I show you with a caveat. And that being said, we can still help as GIS analysts, as GIS users. We can still create information that can help other experts get the data they need to do their job, right? So the first analysis that I wanna run is pretty basic. We're gonna run a hotspot analysis on this county data. And each of these county points happens to have a field called confirmed. Uh, and actually what we can do, I do wanna show you something before we run that analysis. I wanna bring that data over to a pandas data frame. So we're gonna do data frame df equals item that layers. So this item has multiple layers or could have multiple layers and we're gonna query that. And in our query, we're gonna specify that we want that as a, as a data frame. And from there, we're just gonna print the head of the data frame, which really is just essentially a few records at the top. So there's our data that was shown as a map up here, but now in tabular form. We have the province, the state, the country, uh, and the confirmed cases for each county. This is what we want. So now that we see it as a table, we can quickly run some analysis. So I'm gonna click analysis here at the top. If I happen to know the code to run hotspot analysis, I can simply type it in the next cell. But if I don't know that, that's okay. I can find the tool that I wanna run. Once again, it looks a little bit like the web map interface. And I can select add, and it'll create a cell here with the reference to the tool. So let's go ahead and delete that extra cell there. And let's say you don't really know how to run find hotspots. What you can do in Jupyter Notebooks, here's another little tip. You can add a question mark after the call and shift enter that, and it'll bring the tool signature. So here the tool signature gives you a sense of which parameters the tool needs. It needs an analysis layer that's mandatory. It has optional parameters from here on, such as the analysis field, et cetera. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and start passing some information. We're gonna say, item is our analysis layer and our analysis field is going to be confirmed the amount of confirmed cases and we want to say that the result of that is going to be equal to a variable called hotspots and we're going to go ahead and execute that so the notebook server at this point is executing this and a docker container just for me this is isolated to me as a user if other users are using the notebook server, they'll have their own environment where they're executing that, that piece of logic. And while that's executing, we can do a few things. We can go ahead and start creating the next steps of our code. So we're gonna say hotspots map equals gis.map, and we're gonna go ahead and pass USA as our input. We're gonna say that hotspots map, we wanna add a layer, and the layer is going to be hotspots but actually hotspots doesn't return a layer, it returns a dictionary of layers, of layers and messages. So once we get the return, we'll see exactly what we have to pass to the map. There it is. So it returns this dictionary, and what we want is 
this key from that dictionary, basically the, the name of the outputs. And let's go ahead and say, show us that hotspots map. So let's zoom into the United States. So not terribly useful. We know that New York City is, is really struggling right now with a lot of cases and going through the, through the brunt of the, of the surge, right? So hotspot analysis didn't get us too far. Maybe we wanna take a, a stab at a different type of analysis. So we can very quickly copy these cells and paste them and try a different analysis, or I can simply go to analysis and try a different method, which is called find outliers. That's a little bit more helpful. And find outliers, what it does, actually one of my favorite parts of notebooks is we can take a, a photo that explains different analyses. So I'm basically copying and pasting a photo. I'm gonna create a cell here, make it markdown, paste the image, and start to explain the next steps of our analysis. So what hotspot analysis does is it finds statistically significant clustering of high values and low values. Since New York City has so many high values, it really overwhelms this analysis. But outlier analysis really cares not about the highest and the lowest. It cares about these micro regions where there could be a high feature surrounded by low features or a really low feature surrounded by high features. These outliers are really interesting because they could point out sparse areas, maybe rural areas where there's suddenly a new outbreak. So let's go ahead and run that outlier analysis. Now here's another little tip. I showed you the question mark tip earlier to get a sense of the tool. Another one is if you're within the parentheses of the tool, you can select shift tab and it'll give you the tool signature there as well. So for outliers, we need the analysis layer and the analysis field, very similar to hotspots. Our analysis layer is gonna be item. Our analysis field is gonna be confirmed. And once again, we wanna cast that to a variable called outliers. And just like before, I'm gonna take the code here, create a cell down here, paste it, but we're gonna call this outliers map. And instead of hotspots, we're gonna pass it outliers. And this is gonna be called outliers result layer. And we're gonna go ahead and execute it. Uh, by the way, a, a few other tips. If you see this asterisk, it means that the notebook is currently executing that cell. If you see a number, it means that that cell has successfully executed in the past. So you see two cells in the queue right now. You see the outlier analysis right here, which just finished, got it number, and the map with our outlier analysis. So here's the results, and these are quite a bit more interesting. Let's take a look at the hotspot first. In the hotspot, you have obviously the counties that are really part of the New York metro wide region, uh, but we also see these low high outliers, essentially regions that have pretty low amounts of cases compared to the, to the nearby features. But really the ones that I find more interesting are the, the, low, the high lows. So counties that have a lot more cases than the nearby counties based on a, a, on a small neighborhood. And I've been working with Georgia recently. I know that they currently are tracking an outbreak in Albany in Doherty County specifically. So this tool can be a good first pass at using clustering to try to find where maybe some rural areas, some areas that haven't received quite the brunt of impact that New York City has experienced. You can maybe isolate those areas and start to target efforts there. That's a brief example. And what I wanna take you now that we're done with this is essentially how to share something like this with your colleagues or with your teammates. Uh, so I'm gonna save up here. And what you can do is, uh, let's go ahead and select info here at the top. We're gonna to change the name of our notebook. Let's say uh, very basic COVID-19 analysis. And let's go ahead and say V1. We can also add a description. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. Let's just say for review. Uh, once I'm done entering some information, I can go ahead and select share. Once you select share, then it'll give you the option to share that notebook with everyone on your ArcGIS Enterprise, or sorry, everyone, really the public in general, just your ArcGIS Enterprise or specific groups. And in that case, then it becomes a factor of, uh, it becomes an item in your ArcGIS Enterprise. So let's take a look at what that would look like. I'm gonna go to my content now. 
going to go to uh, my most recent item. So there's the notebook. You can see it's a notebook item. There's the default thumbnail. You can take a look at a preview so people can open it. Essentially, the image of what it will, but if they want to see the maps, they can simply open up the notebook. And it has similar settings. You can prevent it from being deleted, et cetera. So that's a brief view of a, of a basic notebook that we really wrote together here in the webinar. I want to show you another example that's really aimed at, at administrators, people that really have to worry about managing users, groups, and content. And in this case, uh, the idea is really how do you avoid the headaches of having to click a million times to add users, create groups, all that stuff. And in this case, I've already created the code and we're not going to write it in real time, but I can share this notebook after the webinar if you're interested. Or better yet, there's some samples that are actually much better than this that I can point you to. And we're going to step through it together from the top to the bottom. First, we're going to create a reference to a GIS, very similar to the first notebook. But now we're going to take a look at, at users instead of analysis. So I'm going to delete that cell. We don't really need that. But what I'd like to point you to is this. Once again, if you have your GIS object, you do a, do a period tab, take a look at what you can do. And there's a very uh, useful submodule called users. And if you don't know what users does, go ahead and do period tab again. That gets you a sense of what the users subclass gets you. So you can go ahead and do a search for users, for example. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. And then shift tab to get a sense of what you need to pass to the search method. Uh, it accepts a query, and that's optional. So let's go ahead and just execute that. So here's the list of users that I have in this ArcGIS Enterprise. Uh, you can also filter further. So I'm going to go ahead and filter for my own last name. It gets you a list with just one entry there. Or for my colleague, Flora, she's actually not part of the enterprise. So if I want to add Flora to my ArcGIS Enterprise, there's another method. If we look from the top bottom, users, period, tab, you can see there's the second item right there called create. And if you don't know what create does, guess again. We do shift tab, get used to those little shortcuts that become really crucial as you're starting to prototype fast. So create accepts quite a few parameters, and a lot of them are mandatory. You need a username, you need a password, you need a first name, a last name, an email. So to create Floravail as our user, we're going to go ahead and, and specify that over here. Her username is going to be her first name, her last name. Her password is going to be Go Gators Forever, uh, since she likes the University of Florida. And here's the rest of her details, first name, last name, email, and her role. So let's go ahead and execute that cell. So there she is as a user object. If I select that, it actually takes me to the link of her user profile. Let's go back to the notebook. And we can query that object, that Flora object. It is a, a, floor, uh, a user object. And like all objects in Python, you can determine what you can do with them, once again, with period tab. You can take a look at, for instance, what is her email, since we specified it earlier. Uh, you can check if she have used your portal. You can get uh, her favorite ID or her favorite group or other interesting things, perhaps her, her role the last time she signed on, et cetera. Uh, we don't need Flora for this example, so I'm actually just going to go ahead and delete Flora, and you can just do that with a flora.delete since she's a user object. So you can do the same with groups. By that same measure, we essentially um, start getting into, into a pattern that you can kind of follow. So you can search for existing groups in this Ar ArcGIS enterprise. We have quite a few. Uh, we can create our group. Instead of calling it our group name, I'm going to call it uh, social distancing. Uh, Fella or fellows, or let's just say group. And if we query that group, it's a group object that we can once again do period tab and start to take a look at what we can do with it. We can copy content to it, we can uh, assign users to it, etc. So here's a, a quick little idea. Let's say that your boss comes over and says, you need to administer a group for every team on this floor. And you need to add every staff member in our office to it. And you, do, you need to do this as soon as possible before our conference. 
So instead of, uh, of having a headache to do that, maybe you can use Python to, to start doing that. And I have a brief example here where I have an Excel sheet with users. By the way, there is a file, a local file system in Notebook Server. And in that local file system, you can pass Excel files, you can pass file geodatabases, shape files, images, really whatever you need for your notebooks. Uh, so I happen to have an Excel here. I'm just gonna go ahead and load that Excel into the notebook by reading it into a pandas data frame. So I have just six records, not too many, or actually seven. And this has a list of users that I need to add. Obviously, you could have an Excel file that could be a lot more users that corresponds to maybe your staff listing. And you could be build a, a for loop or an iteration that just goes list or item by item, assigns them a user profile and creates them and adds them to a group. So we're just gonna go ahead and do that. And again, if you're missing some of the Python code, it's okay, you can follow through this example after the fact. I think this is just to show you the concept. And a couple of tips, I create two lists. You may notice here if we get into the details. One is a demo users list, and this is really just the name of the user. And then the other one is the actual user objects. And you can use those two things for different purposes. So here's the list of users. These are just the user names and then the user objects. The user objects are gonna be things that you can, for instance, check when the last time they signed on, et cetera. And we can display the list of user objects. Basically, we can check uh, the new people that we added to our portal. Just like that, we added seven folks to our ArcGIS Enterprise. Programmatically, you could really start to build this really uh, comprehensive system that can quickly add people to your enterprise. And we can add those users to uh, your demo group that we created earlier. And the return is a little confusing, admittedly. It says not added and then an empty list. All this means is that if there were any issues adding users to this demo group, it would tell you that there's an error here. So the fact that we don't have errors is good. Now we can check that demo group for the members that we have. I'm the owner of that group, but we have a quite a few new folks that we added to it, including Tyson, Renee, Melchiades, Kate, et cetera. And now if we check our demo group, we can click that, it'll take you to your group. And if we check the list of users, there's all our users. So just from Python, from that notebook, we're starting to administer our portal and do quite a bit from there. So now let's do the opposite. Let's say that the conference is done, your big event is done, you wanna spin things down, you don't need quite that many users. So your boss comes back and says, before you head home, you need to go clean up everything that you have on that enterprise. So instead of getting a headache like our, our friend here, just go ahead and code that and basically take a look at your demo group and remove users using that demo users list. So once again, you get a list of any issues that may have happened in the removal process, the fact that we don't have any issues is good. And we can also go ahead and delete our, our folks from, from the enterprise. We can also clean up our demo group and be ready for the next go round. So this is a brief example of administration. I understand this is pretty fast, but this is just really to show you the concepts. My advice to you is actually, uh, if you get started with notebooks, especially notebook server, there's a samples button here at the top right. Go ahead and click this. From the samples uh, button, it takes you to what we call the gallery of notebooks. And in the gallery of notebooks, you see uh, notebooks that pertain to three, three types, uh, content management, administration, and data science. So uh, one of my favorites for administration is deploying automatic notifications. If we click that, it would give you a guide on how to create a notebook that would notify your users through email, through text, or through even like Slack uh, regarding the last time they signed on and whether they're about to lose access to your enterprise, for example. So I'm not gonna go through the, the notebook, but really I just wanna highlight some of the capabilities. This notebook would help you get spun up and gives you an example on how to write a notebook that would notify someone if they're about to lose their account or if they haven't logged in in uh, let's say 20 days. Or uh, you can set up a prank notebook that would text your best friends at maybe in the middle of the night if you wanna get uh, a little bit funnier. So from there, another thing that I definitely wanna highlight is our sample notebooks that pertain to analysis, to data science. 
So if you click this filter from the gallery of notebooks, it takes us to all these other notebooks that really pertain to doing analysis. And there's quite a few concepts. Uh, for example, we have a deep learning notebook example that shows you how to use ArcGIS.learn to detect swimming pools from overhead imagery. We have examples that use spatial statistics to identify urban heat islands. And the one that I think is quite timely is this example on predicting asthma hospitalization rates. So in this notebook, it's a little bit complex, admittedly. I'm, once again, I just wanna show you the concepts. I have it already open here. But if you're really starting to get into statistics, into data science, machine learning, et cetera, I really, really recommend that you take a look at these examples. They're really what, like we've peer reviewed a lot of the spatial statistics notebooks to make sure that they're robust and, and follow good guidelines. But uh, while it's a lot of code, I think this can really help you see some of the capabilities. In this case, we're building a, a predictive model for asthma hospitalization rates using training data at the county level and predicting down at the block group level. And especially when we start to get into concepts like teen and, and things like that, when we're trying to model uh, demographic et cetera, something like this can be quite helpful. You can also start to get creative with how you implement these notebooks. For example, this is a chart using Bokeh in Python. And what this chart tells us is if you're trying to assess which variables help us predict asthma hospitalizations, uh, which ones should we keep in the model? And in this example, there are three variables that really stand out. Whether you smoked cigarettes in the last 12 months, whether you happen to have health insurance, and whether your household poverty levels are below, or whether your household income is below poverty level. Those three variables for predicting asthma hospitalizations came back, not necessarily as the most correlated, but really the ones that are most important for building a good model, or at least a better model. Um, I wanna point you to a few other examples. Uh, if you Google search S3 ArcGIS Python API, and we can provide a lot of these examples after the fact, um, there's a GitHub repository that ha has a lot of examples. And this, these are more pertaining to the Python API, but if you click the samples folder, you can see examples broken down by different roles. For example, getting started, power users, administrators, analysts and data scientists, or content publishers. If you look at analysts and data scientists, there's quite a few new examples. For example, uh, there's one on vehicle object detection and tracking. This one takes you through a brief view of how to basically train a model to observe vehicles on web cameras. And this is particularly for departments of transportation that are trying to track uh, essentially activity on the roads using other sources of information. Um, another thing that I definitely wanna point you to is the official documentation for the Python API. This is developers.arcgis.com slash Python. And there's a tab here called Sample Notebooks. And Sample Notebooks takes you once again to, to a listing of uh, notebooks that you can learn from. Uh, let me see, maybe we can find a good one. This one on analyzing violent crime, I think is quite popular. You can download the examples and just try locally or try it live or load it into your notebook server. And a lot of these examples have documentation that include essentially how to get spun up on that example. So that's a brief view of ArcGIS Enterprise and Notebook Server and a lot of what's included uh, in a fast pace. I wanna shift gears now to a really exciting development and that's the addition of notebooks to ArcGIS Pro. And for this example, what I wanna highlight is um, this idea that uh, for COVID-19, once again, related to this, we're not tracking just cases. We're not just tracking how many positive cases there are across the world or across the country. We really also wanna measure testing, for instance. The idea that we don't have a good denominator for mortality, for instance, unless we have a lot of tests is really powerful. And what we did here, I'm gonna stop sharing and switch over to ArcGIS Pro to show you notebooks in ArcGIS Pro. There we go. So now you see ArcGIS Pro. And what we have here is a layer that shows tests uh, for COVID-19 by state. 
this data comes from the COVID tracking project. And the idea here is I don't necessarily want all my users to run Python code. Perhaps they don't know Python, perhaps they don't have time to learn Python. All they need is the data and they may know how to run a geoprocessing tool. So we have this geoprocessing tool called get testing data. It's pretty basic. All you need to pass to it is an output feature class and it'll go gather today's testing data and write it here as an output layer. So we're gonna run that. And after a short while here, we're going to essentially get today's amount of tests per state. This is actually, so the, the outputs are look ginormous. And this is actually because this is a success story, especially recently in the US. Testing has definitely ramped up on a state by state case. If you look back at the original layer, this is from March 24th, a little over two weeks ago. Really very few states were testing uh, comprehensively. Washington state was testing at a rate of about 4,600 per million. For comparison, uh, South Korea set the standard and they had a testing rate of about 6,000 per million. Uh, New York state started ramping up, especially as things got worse there. They were about 4,500 4, per million. But if we look back to today, this is the most recent data. We almost have to change the symbology now because all the states are doing much, much better. Uh, Washington state now has 12,000 tests per million. So let's go ahead and change that symbology a little bit. And I know this is in Python, but I do wanna highlight essentially what Python can empower if you write your processing tools. So I'm gonna lower this to 45 and change this to refresh values. There we go. So now the scale has changed entirely. The upper ranges are 10,000 tests per million residents. And this geoprocessing tool, what I wanna highlight is the way we wrote that is we started with a notebook in ArcGIS Pro. We started basically writing pseudocode. We just started writing the steps of what we needed to do. We knew that we needed to ingest data, we needed to prepare it by geocoding it and calculate testing rates, and we needed to export it to a local feature class. And from there, we just started filling in the necessary code. We knew that this was the web page for the COVID tracking API. From there, we can go retrieve the latest data for the current date. We can use uh, Python's daytime module to get today's date. We can make a reference to the existing pro project. Then we can start preparing the data, bring in a layer of states to bring geometry to those tests. And then finally, we can export to a local feature class. And a notebook really becomes a powerful way to quickly prototype the sequence, right? If you're trying to get started with a geoprocessing tool for your fellow GIS users, uh, very frequently, I just start from a notebook. I start writing the steps. I start saying, what do I need to do here? And once you're satisfied with the sequence, you can execute it from the notebook. And then when you think about how to create a GUI for this logic, then you bring it to the geoprocessing uh, framework. And at that point, it's pretty straightforward to export this Python code, make it a Python toolbox, and then let people simply invoke it through ArcGIS Pro. That's one brief example, and that's really useful these days to get daily testing data. The second example, and really my final example, is something that we're quite excited about that has immediate use. So I'm gonna share a different Pro project. Let me stop sharing here and switch to that project. There we go. We recently wrapped up development on the first version of something called the CHIME model. The CHIME model can be used to forecast hospitalization needs from COVID related disease, uh, particularly the amount of hospital beds that are expected based on a lot of assumptions, the amount of ICU units, the amount of patients being admitted to, the, to a ventilator. And uh, again, a lot of caveats. I'm not an epidemiologist. You need to take this with a lot of uh, assumptions. But for the folks that do have good data for the states and uh, or for other countries that have good data, this CHIME model uh, came from uh, uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And we were simply wrapped that up using uh, Python and in many cases using Jupyter Notebooks to prototype and wrapped it up as a geoprocessing tool. So I'm simply gonna execute the geoprocessing tool. What you have here in the input layer is the amount of cases by county in Florida. 
Uh, and this is actually, so let me, before I show the outputs, I want to explain the inputs really briefly. We have all the counties in Florida, and we have the amount of counties or amount of cases that test, or sorry, the amount of tests that came back positive for COVID-19. And that becomes an input uh, for the tool. We also have to tell the tool how many, how much is the disease spreading. So there's a lot of uh, detail here. I'm not going to get too deep into it, but the idea here is the concept can really extend to current events and you can quickly prototype with Python to, to get functionality at the door, if, especially during an emergency. We probably will do a webinar in the not too distant future, specifically on this model, if that's of interest. Uh, but what we have now here from the output is we have a forecast. Over the next 60 days, starting from March 31st, we're taking a look at the new daily admissions projected for Florida and a census of daily hospitalizations, ICU, and ventilations. This is using a baseline approach. Basically, we're saying that no social distancing is happening, that people are not going to take the effort to stay at home, uh, not go to work or to populated places. And the circumstances do get pretty dire. So if I show all the charts that get produced with this output, uh, essentially, we're ex we, this model, again, a lot of assumptions, but this would forecast that there would be several million people infected, whether that's tested or not, that's a separate story, but there would be millions of infections if people don't engage in social distancing. So the part that I wanted to end with is this is a geoprocessing tool. However, what we're seeing is that a lot of organizations that are using this tool uh, don't just run it once. They need to run it several times for different scenarios. So this is the baseline run that we just ran. I'm going to copy these two cells in a Jupyter notebook here in, Python, in ArcGIS Pro and copy twice for two different scenarios. The first one is going to be a scenario called A, where limited social distancing And for limited social distancing, we're how much people do uh, essentially engage socially. And then for the second run, we're going to say this is going to be scenario B, and this is going to be a lot more social distancing. We're going to say that people, uh, let's say medium actually, we're going to say that people cut down on uh, social interactions by 50%. So now we have this Jupyter Notebook that has a baseline run of projections, a scenario A with limited social distancing, and a scenario B with medium social distancing. And this can be quite useful if you're trying to model what should you do for, or what should a particular policy agency do for a state in terms of opening up again and, and letting people come back out and, and do social interactions. So I'm gonna execute these two. First, I'm gonna, actually, I do wanna change the output names. So let's go ahead and name this 30% social distancing. Same for the sum. 30% social distancing. Let's go ahead and execute that. And while that executes, I'm going to change the output name for this one, say 50% social distancing, and same for this one. And if you're not tracking all of this Python, please don't worry. Again, the idea is to show you the concept. If you want to get down into the code later, we can uh, definitely share all of this. So I'm going to, I just ran scenario A. Let's go ahead and take a look at those outputs. So First of all, I want to put the outputs of the baseline run, specifically the census of daily hospitalizations. And here's a little trick. You can use your snipping tool in Windows, capture this chart, copy that snippet, and in a notebook, you can create a markdown cell and simply paste. And now you have essentially the output of that run stamped into that notebook so that you can share it with like a policy maker or maybe another analyst that needs to look at that. So this is the baseline. And now let's take a look at what that would look like with a 30% social distancing reduction. I'm gonna bring in that chart. Now the scale is quite a bit different. Uh, so let's go ahead and lock that down. If we look at the notebook and let me collapse this a little bit so we can see more. The scale in the notebook goes all the way up to 130,000. So let's change this axis to have a maximum of 130,000. There we go. So now we can see how social distancing is really 
projected to make a difference and why a lot of policies went that way. Uh, so let me expand this just a tiny bit more. There we go. And take another snapshot. With that snapshot, then we can paste it into our notebook. So the results of 30% social distancing now are here. And finally, the results of 50% social distancing. Sorry, I started clicking everywhere. Uh, and that would be by executing scenario B. So let's go ahead and run that. And that should be popping out here in the table of contents shortly. Great. And let's take a look at that output. So daily hospital census. And wow, that's quite a bit different, down to 32,000. I'm going to change the access once again, make it 130,000 at the most. And you can really start to see the dramatic changes in, in that concept of flattening the curve. Uh, so let's take a screenshot of that and include it with our analysis notebook. And again, this is a basically a brief demonstration. The analysis that really should go into something as important as, as modeling impact needs uh, should be quite a bit more robust, but hopefully this gets the concept across. So just like that, we have uh, run the projection tool, but really what I like about notebooks is this ability to uh, document your workflow. It's very akin to building a model in Model Builder and sharing it with someone else so that they can repeat your workflow or looking at your geoprocessing history to repeat what you did. So from there, we can basically save our project, save our notebook, send it to someone or have them open it up in notebook server and continue on. And you can see uh, just from this tool, the change from no social distancing with a peak hospitalization, census of about 130,000 about a month from the start point. With 30%, the curve is flattened. Now it would be about 40 days from the start of 70,000. And with really harsh social distancing measures, the curve, we don't even really see the peak, but it would be beyond two months. Uh, and then you can start to think about what to do from there, right? So I'm going to wrap up now, and I do want to share a couple of resources. So let me stop sharing and switch to my final point here. Uh, let me, sorry, let me go back to my browser and make sure that I'm sharing the right screen. Okay, hopefully you see my browser at this point. So the Chime tool that I briefly showed, uh, we can share that resource as a link perhaps with the materials that will be part of this webinar. And that can be invoked through Python. And I know that this webinar was primarily about Python and the notebook server, but there's a lot of utility for analysis in Python. And I wanted to share a few use cases of timely uh, work with this. Uh, I also wanted to share primarily how a lot of our users are learning about Python, and that's learn.arcgis.com. Learn.arcgis.com contains learn lessons, and learn lessons are really these classes, essentially, that include uh, data. It includes all the content that you need to actually follow through a problem, a solution, and a way to repeat it for other concepts. And this is probably one of the best ways to get started. Another uh, important update is that we recently had our virtual developer summit and all of the videos from the developer summit have been now released in our Esri events YouTube channel. So if you Google Esri events YouTube, uh, you should see that YouTube channel. And from there you can see, let's take a look. Uh, the most recent videos include a lot of content pertaining to Python and to notebook server, et cetera. I definitely recommend that you take a look at the most recent updates because we're showing some of the new concepts. And finally, my last point is there is now a, a beta for notebooks in ArcGIS Online. And this is the next release, uh, basically, of notebooks. So we're looking at ArcGIS Online here, my particular organization that I belong to. And if you click Notebook, you will be greeted by a window that says, welcome to ArcGIS Notebooks Beta for ArcGIS Online. There will be a runtime that you have to select, whether you want to have a standard notebook, one with advanced that includes ArcPy, 
or one with advanced and GPU support if you happen to be doing some work perhaps with TensorFlow or other machine learning libraries that would benefit from GPU. From there, uh, it really behaves like a typical Jupyter notebook uh, with all the bells and whistles that I showed earlier. So if you are particularly interested, go to ArcGIS Online, participate in the beta, and give us feedback. All of that feedback is really useful to help us make sure that this product helps you in the work that you're doing. And with that, I'd like to actually thank all of you for the work that you do. It would be awesome to see you in person someday, but for now, we'll have to take questions remotely. And thank you again for your time. All right, so let's uh, look through some of the questions that we have. Um, we had a few questions on the scheduling function. Um, so if you could um, maybe go over that or possibly demo how to schedule um, on the notebook server. Yep, certainly. So let me take a look at the questions. I'm going back through Q&A. Can the scheduling capabilities be demonstrated? Yes. So let me share my screen. OK, so let me confirm that I do have that enabled in my notebook server, actually. <laughs> Maybe I said yes a little bit too fast. Yeah, I, I apologize. I said yes too fast. Uh, if you can see my screen, you should see the, the basic notebook that interface that I was showing you earlier. But the scheduling interface would be an additional button here. And once selected, it would let you essentially establish a scheduled task that the server will use to schedule this notebook and execute it. Um, let me check if pro by any chance I have access to a, yeah, perhaps what I should do, sorry, I was gonna try to search for another environment that perhaps already had scheduling enabled. But what we can do is share some materials on the scheduling feature with the content that will be shared with this webinar. And this is one of the newest features. I know one of the most recent releases was where this was targeted. Uh, and I, it is one of the newer features, so we have to test it quite a bit more. And I would have to prepare a demonstration for that. So I apologize. I don't have a, a good demonstration of it here, but we can share that content soon. So just for my own curiosity, would that be enabled by the administrator then? Uh, that's a good question. So. There's been, let me check, and by that measure, let me actually show you what it looks like to administer a notebook server. Uh, sorry, let me go to servers. And this is a side note, by the way, if you go to your ArcGIS Enterprise, the settings and servers, you will see the federated notebook server. If you click that, it actually takes you to the new notebook server manager interface. And what I'm trying to see, and I don't know the answer at the top of my head, I apologize, but for configuring whether, whether notebooks can be scheduled, I believe that is a role permission, but I would have to confirm and get back to you. Now, while right. we're here, I may, may as well mention this, which is an important point. This notebook server manager interface can be really useful if you're the administrator for an ArcGIS enterprise. This lets you see recent errors in your notebook server. For instance, here's all the logs that have been included with warning or maybe severe type. Uh, for instance, I know that I'm low on space in terms of low on disk space for that local file space. So it is logging that. Or if I wanna see which containers are currently active, I have three Docker containers currently running. I can delete some of these containers if I wanna free up resources for other users. Um, and I can also get a bit more specific with the logging and the settings. Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for scheduling, but that's a good question. We can get back to you on that. All right, um, we have another question about the TensorFlow library. Um, does it need to be installed on the computer? It must must be any additional installation of TensorFlow on the portal site. The TensorFlow library comes included with the Docker environment that the Python notebook 
or the notebook server um, uses. But you can also add libraries if there's other libraries that you need to use for your processes or your users with depend on. You can definitely um, do installations at the notebook level, or you can perhaps change the the Docker image that use it that each notebook uses when it loads. That last part I have to confirm to be honest, but you can, as an individual user, you can use a magic command to install individual libraries. So yes. Great. And I think for the last question, um, can you show how to convert a notebook code into a geoprocessing tool? Uh, we can share some resources on how to do that. Uh, it would take a little bit more time than we have available. But uh, there's documentation on how to create a Python toolbox. And we can share the link to that, certainly. The notebook code does need to be edited uh, a light amount before you change it into a geoprocessing tool. You essentially need to specify the input parameters. And depending on how much capability you want to give in your GUI, you have to think a little bit about the, the GUI at that point. But from there, the main logic, the core logic of your geoprocessing would be done on the notebook side. And that's the part that you typically want to spend a lot of time prototyping. Great. Thank you so much, Alberto. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, we will be sending out a video recording, as well as some of the resources that we've discussed and Alberto's slides. Thank you, great. everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.